Sales is the only profession in the world where you could shut your mouth, go close a client and make them pay for the bill. Welcome back to the Dream Out Loud podcast. In this episode, I sit down with Daniel G. Daniel was ranked as the number one sales trainer in the entire world in 2023. Most people don't focus on being trained, so they wing sales. I always say either you're a world-class closer or you're a world-class winger. And together we sat down and we've created a masterclass for you all on the topic of sales. Sales is the only thing inside of the world that doesn't give a f- about. We cover so many things in this episode from how to increase your self-worth and your self-image as a salesperson. The charisma, the enthusiasm thing, it takes you to a six-figure income. But then that person that makes it into a skill set, they just become a... We even sit down and we do live role-playing and I hit him with real in-person objections and watch him overcome them in real time. You can learn exactly how to overcome common objections. Look, Daniel, I just don't have the money. Like oh, this. objection I have to moved. Know, I have to objection know all moved. the ingredients. What you just gave me an objection about money. You can learn how to close deals like like a freaking pro. To program yourself right inside of sales, make sure you tell yourself. And overall, you gotta learn how to think much bigger and achieve more success and results in your life. Why do you love sales so much? Because it changed my life, man. Sales has changed so many people's lives unexpectedly. Guys, this is a jam-packed episode and you're going to freaking love it. If you're brand new here, welcome to the Dream Out Loud podcast. The only thing I'll ever ask from you guys is just to hit that subscribe button because it means that we can get bigger and better guests on the podcast which then means we can make the content even better for you. And if you're coming back, welcome back to Dream Nation. Now let's get into this episode. Daniel G, my man. My guy. Welcome back to the podcast, brother. Appreciate you having me, man. And welcome to Australia. Thank you, you thank you. You finally got let in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mate, I want to dive right into this. Obviously, we're about to have an amazing night tonight. We're about to run, run an event in Sydney, all on sales, mindset, business. And I know one thing you're really big on is world-class standard. I think your whole thing is world-class world closes, yeah. right? Yep. So in your opinion, what separates a world-class salesperson from someone who's just average and mediocre? Somebody that's trained. Somebody that's trained. Most people don't focus on being trained, you know, so they wing sales. I always say either you're a world-class closer or you're a world-class winger. You know, like winger, like most people improvise sales. Uh, they feed off sales off their good enthusiasm, good charisma, just like you and I, maybe, you know, high energy, good charisma, good enthusiasm it takes you to one point inside of sales but then i always say somebody that's a closer you know is a person that mix in their good attitude plus their skill set they don't rely on one some people they always you know they usually try to get picky meaning if they have good charisma they're like well i don't need the skill sets or they have good skill sets they're like well i won't need the positive attitude today it's like why fucking pick it's just like just do both you know, have good charisma and at the same time, you know, mix it in with skill sets. I think, you know, the charisma, the enthusiasm thing, it takes you to a six figure income, 100,000, 200,000. But then that person that mix it in with skill set, they just become a beast. To me, it's, it's like, you know, you have people saying, you know, you don't need thick skin inside of sales. You just need to be skilled. So I hear one trainer say this, man, you don't need to be thick skin. It's so stupid to work your numbers. You don't need to work hard. Don't be that burnout sales rep. And then you have another sales trainer saying, no, 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 work your numbers and work your ass off. And then I always sat down listening to sales trainers when I was young and I'm like, well, why not just fucking do both? Why not have thick skin at the same time, have thick skin and also have a sharp ax every single time? That person becomes a beast. Like why, why pick? Like have the thick skin and the skills. Like have the skin and the skills. You know what I mean? Most people, they either have thick skin in the beginning and then they develop the skills slowly, naturally or get trained and then the way they lose is they lose the thick skin, which is the work ethic and the numbers because now they got the skills. So what they can do in half of the amount of time, right? Now they could reach out to 100 people and get 10 closes instead of reaching out to 1,000 people and get 10 closes. And then their thick skin freaking loses. I always say in sales, just do both. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Don't pick. That's what I think a world-class closer does. They have thick freaking skin and they have great skills and they never stop sharpening their skills. You mentioned about the charisma. So yeah. Talk to me about that because I know some people who are pretty introverted that make killer salespeople as well. Mm-hmm. So do you have to have this charisma, this extrovertedness kind of like you to crush at sales or how does someone who's kind of more introverted bring out their inner charisma? The introverts that you see crush it inside of sales have a burning desire and meaning it doesn't have to be extroverted where they're yelling off mountaintops, but they have a constrained enthusiasm where their hunger outweighs their charisma and their passion. Because I feel like introverts, just like you said, because you and I have seen introverts smash it inside of sales. The the people that say, oh, I'm introverted. I don't know if I'm going to be good at sales. I said, well, that doesn't mean you're fucking lazy. It doesn't mean you're lazy. 
Introverts doesn't mean you're lazy. Introverts just means you're not feeding off other people's, you know, energy when you're going to rooms and you're going into mm -hmm. events. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. I almost feel like you got to understand that you almost been effed to say you're an introvert. So I'll, 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 this, is, this is good for people to listen to. It's like, well, of course you're a fucking introvert. Of course. You're not programmed to be an extrovert. You're programmed to be an introvert. You're not programmed to... Heck, we got in trouble for being extroverts inside of school. We got in trouble. If you spoke too loud inside of class, if you made jokes to somebody, you got in trouble for being an extrovert inside of school. So of course you're supposed to grow up with this label just saying, hey, by the way, I'm introverted. Like if, if, you, if you really think of it, think of the school system, modern day school system, or actually school hasn't even freaking changed. It's like, okay, go to school, sit down 90% of the time, present five to 10% of the time on shit that you don't even like, by the way. So of course you're not programmed to be an effective communicator, et cetera. So I always feel like you almost have to say, wait, am I actually introverted? Or is this somebody that somebody that just labeled me to be introverted? And that was a repetition, of course, through school. So you're just repeated, say, okay, now I'm an introvert. And the only way to break that repeti or the only way to break that pattern is repeat it the opposite way now. Do sales enough times, forget about the label, reach out to enough people, get the pit out of your stomach and realize it's actually easy, right? Mm. Realize, hey, by the way, you know, handling some of these objections is not freaking rocket science. It's like we overthink it. Prospecting somebody and shaking a hand or reaching out to somebody on Instagram, it's not rocket science, it's just a repetition game, right? So I, I, I want to talk about this more as well. So let me ask you a question. When it comes time for you to recharge your batteries, mm -hmm. you personally, do you like to be by yourself or do you like to be around Alone, people? usually. So you're probably more introverted. Majority of the time. <clears throat> right, but I know a lot of people would probably look at you and go, oh, but I can't do what he does, he's so extroverted. I know people look at me and say the same thing. Yeah. I'm actually more introverted. Yeah. When I like to, and I'm on stage for 40 hours at a time at a weekend seminar, you know, with, with people. And, but when it's when it's time for me to recharge, I'm like, everyone leave me alone. I want to just be by myself. Um, and, and I think the whole labeling of what people perceive, because I, I know a lot of people think, Oh, but I'm introverted. I can't be good at sales, yeah. or I can't be good at communication, or or whatever. But the the wrong labeling of it, I think, is what's fucking them up the most. Because you just said then, and I'm the same. It's like, well, probably technically by by real label definition, I'm actually more introverted, and kind of so are you. But it's like we know when the times to perform and do our thing, we bring out our best. Yeah, right. Exactly. So the the labels, I think, are, are fucking most people. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's. Listen, to me, the the this shit's gotten so soft. Like, you know, entrepreneurship and business gotten soft. I don't, I don't, I, ne I never even thought of this. Like, when I was young, I wasn't even thinking about am I an introvert or am I an extrovert? I'll mm -hmm. give you the deal. My deal was this. My parents split up when I was young. I was 13 and a half. And I got my first direct sales job, door-to-door -door sales. I didn't have fucking time to think if I was introverted or extroverted. I didn't have time to think if I was shy or not. They got me a sales job. They said, here's a machine. It, poke hole, it pokes holes in people's grass. Knock on doors, sell the service. I didn't have time to think of a couple different things. Am I introverted or am I fucking extroverted? Am I passionate or am I not passionate? Both of the bullshit things that you hear in today's side. Do you have to be passionate to sell a product? It's like, I didn't have time to think about it. My work ethic and my fucking hunger, me being broke, over suffocated both of those two things. Introverted and extroverted, passionate or not freaking passionate. My, my hunger to make money suffocated both of those things. So I said, your hunger and desire to freaking win should suffocate the label of you being introverted or extroverted, should suffocate you being passionate or not freaking passion. Passion is just the cherry on top. Being extroverted and high enthusiasm is the freaking cherry on top. And you might not even get there until you figure out you like it. Maybe getting a few extra dollars in your pocket. You're like, oh shit, I like doing this. I'm making a little bit more money. Love turns into passion. Maybe you start developing passion, but I always say passion is the cherry on top inside of sales. And I don't think you need to be passionate, by the way, to make a lot of money in sales. This is also a myth. Like, hey, do you have to be passionate about the product that you're selling? And, you know, it's 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 good for Instagram, for entrepreneurs to say, oh yeah, you have to be passionate about the thing that you're doing. Have to is a big word. Have to, wait, 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 let's describe it. To make a million bucks, you don't have to be passionate to make a million bucks. How? I know a lot of freaking CEOs that are not fucking passionate about designing bottle caps for toothpaste tubes well guess what they did they made a product found the people that needed the freaking product mm -hmm. solved the problem sold them the product fucking sales they're more passionate about the business yeah they're itself. just passion they're just hungry to win yeah. Yeah. they just want to win that's the that's the difference their hunger outweighs the passion it's like in sales you just don't have to be passionate if and if you land right now in a position right and i think obviously passion is the cherry on top 
Of course, you're going to thrive when you're passionate about something. But what are you going to do? Wait 18 years until you find a fucking passionate opportunity? Sometimes in the, in the direction of walking in the unknown, you find things that you like and don't like inside of life. So I always say it's like, hey, in sales, the problem, the product that you have right now, you solve a problem, find the prospects that have those problems, solve the problem, get paid a commission. That's sales, right? So yeah, I think it's just a label, man. How much does so one's self-worth come into play when they're selling, growing a business? Yeah, it's huge. I mean, my, my whole line has always been this. Maybe you've heard me say this on Instagram, but my whole line has always been, you can never outperform the person that you think you are inside of the future. That's been my whole line. So what that stems down to is like, if you don't feel you're worth a $50,000 a month, let's just say you're $100,000 a month, your self-worth, you don't feel like you're worth $100,000 a month, then everything you do from an investment standpoint, a strategy standpoint, an actionable standpoint, a sales standpoint, it can never outperform that number what you feel like you're worth. So even from an investment standpoint, if you feel like you're only worth $20,000 a month and you've already hit 15,000 last month inside of commissions and you only feel that you're worth 20, well now with that $15,000 that you made in commissions last month in November, you won't go take that 15,000, put 10,000 back into your business because you feel like you're worth a $50,000 a month business you'll probably go take the 15,000 and go spend the money because you'll never outperform even from an actionable standpoint or from an investment standpoint what you feel like you're worth inside of the future. Every single action that you take today, if I were to go pee on this wall, what that means is if I literally go take a piss on the side of the wall right now and I know somebody can be recording it, like Etienne can be recording or some shit, what does that mean? That basically means that I don't think in the future I would be somebody public so it dictates my actions today. So whatever I do today is a complete reflection of who I think I'm going to become inside of the future. So if I do fuck all today, I, I don't think I'm going to become somebody being inside of the future. Obviously, I don't care about my public image. If I go piss on a wall, I don't care if it ends up in the newspaper seven years down the road. So I always say your self-worth. And I think it's actually, it's, it's insanity sometimes because I think some people put a goal over like their human capabilities. Like they put a materialistic goal over a human capability that probably created the goal that they wanted. And people watching this like, what the fuck does that mean? So this year in the beginning of the year, I told my guys, I'm like, guys, 2025, we're gonna fly private every single event. This is gonna be my jet. This is gonna, these are gonna be the seats. This is how many people it's gonna hold. It's gonna hold 12 people. This is gonna be my fucking captain. I already got my flight crew set up. I got my captain set up. He has his co-pilot set up. And I'm telling them all this. I'm you said this, this is in your mind, right? Yeah, I'm telling all my guys okay. this. Beginning yep. this February, I told them this. First thing, you already start to hear the feedback. Yeah, man, do you think we really need it, man? That's a little bit difficult. How the fuck are we gonna get a jet in two years? What do you think the expense will be? I said, hold the fuck up. I said, you're scared about this shit? A jet? A jet. Well, yeah, man, you're a little bit young. I said, can I tell you something? I'm like, you know the Wright brothers? They're like, yeah. I said, they fucking invented a plane. They figured out a way for a bird, a plane, to go up in the sky and fly from Toronto, Canada to where we are right now in fucking Sydney. They figured out a way to fly a plane. They're the same mind that you're using to doubt the fucking jet. They figured out a way to get a plane in the air, fly the freaking plane across the world, and you can't even get a freaking jet. I said, you're human. The Wright brothers are human. I said, so it's just like with everything inside of life. I say, you guys both have the same mind. I said, it's just that they didn't have a lid on their human capabilities. They fucking mm. invented a plane. Now you don't think we could buy the plane? I said, something's messed up. It's like, I, I made a joke once. I'm like, to this girl, I said, she's like, well, you know, it's hard for me to, you know, make a sale over Instagram, blah, blah. I'm like, isn't it crazy? You can't make a sell sale over fucking Instagram, but somebody developed Instagram. I'm like, what do you think's harder? Somebody like you're complaining that you can't make a sale over a telephone. I'm like, whoever, I don't know who invented the telephone, Graham Bell? Or is that Graham electricity? Bell. Graham Bell? Graham Bell. Thomas Edison? One of those no, two. No, Edison was light. I think light. it was Bell. Edison was light. Yeah. Fucking Bell made a telephone. You can't make a sale over a telephone. <laughs> like, what are we talking about here? You so, know? so you're really saying, so it's the limitations of the mind. So the beliefs, we're, we're, we're stuck, we're constrained to what we believe is possible or not possible. Yeah. Also, what we believe we're possible of or what we're even deserving of, of having so the question would be how how can one so little sally or betty who's watching this right now going i get you 
and they're inside their head and they've got the reasons that are stopping them from really calling in or having the audacity or the belief or the certainty to say, I want a jet or I just want to make a million dollars this year, a hundred grand. How can they go about actually increasing that, that thermostat? It's the dream. The it's a dream. You heard me say this recently on my Instagram. I said uh, the whole thing of people saying like, oh, you know, you shouldn't sell the dream because that's all I'm doing right now. You and I are doing this right that's now. That's my hope. Yeah. yeah. It's like your, your thing is dream fest. Yeah. And dream out loud. This podcast. Dream out loud. This is the podcast, yep. Dream Out Loud. Well, fuck, this is perfect then to say this because you've probably heard this a million times throughout your career. You're in network marketing. You heard this a million times. I hear it every single day. Oh, he's just selling the dream, blah, blah, blah. And then I started to say, I'm just like, well, fuck right. Yeah. You are right. I'm selling the dream. I said, if 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 I don't sell somebody the dream, somebody else is going to sell them the nightmare. Yeah. I said, I'd rather be the person fucking selling the dream than selling the nightmare because the person that's winning inside of our organization or our company or our industry Fuck, it's 10 times better. They have nicer clothes, nicer cars, nicer watches, nicer lifestyle, travel 15 times a year. I don't want to buy these people's freaking nightmare. So I said, in life, I will be the dream seller. So I started saying this to people. I'm like, I will be the fucking person selling the dream, saying, yes, think you can buy a freaking plane. Think you can live in Miami, Florida on freaking Star Island. Do whatever you want to do. Sell, the, I say, live the freaking dream. And in order to live the dream, I said, number one, you got to buy the dream from somebody. Then you got to sell the dream and then you can live the freaking dream. So buy into the idea. You have that to it's buy possible. into the idea that it's possible. Exactly. Buy into the idea that it's possible. Number two, once you bought into, you have to sell the people on the dream, whatever that dream is for them, right? Because everybody has a dream life. And then number three, you can live the freaking dream. I don't think it's a bad thing selling the dream. I think you're in competition with people that sell a freaking nightmare inside of life, right? Like buying, you should, you should own fucking selling the dream. Why not? I don't get it. Like some people hide behind it. Like they're scared. It's almost like an insult. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it, it, it's like an insult when people are like, oh, you know, you're selling the dream. I say, well, fuck, man, I'm in such heavy competition right now. There's a bunch of school systems, outdated school systems that are selling people the fucking nightmare. And at the end of it, I looked at the end of this whole lifestyle that they sold us. I'm like, this doesn't even look fucking fun. I don't want to buy into this person's life. Have you heard about the experiment that scientists did with a group of monkeys in a cage? Maybe. So scientists put six monkeys into a cage. So the biggest thing I always talk about is the power of our environment, right? Because what you're talking about right here is literally, you know, so scientists put six monkeys in a cage. They put a ladder in the cage with a bunch of bananas at the top of the ladder. One monkey goes up the ladder to get the bananas and the others got scalded with water. And then eventually these monkeys would beat the shit out of the monkey that went up the ladder because they realized, hey, every time you go up the ladder, we get punished. So they clicked onto it. Eventually no monkey would go up the ladder. They replace one monkey, they put in a brand new one, he goes up the ladder, he gets a sheep beaten out of him by all the other ones. And this guy's left wondering like, what the fuck did I just walk into? They replace another monkey, he goes up the ladder, they all beat the shit out of him, including the other one who just joined in, didn't yeah. know why. They kept doing this all day long until every single monkey in there was brand new, not one of them had been up the ladder and not one of them had been scalded with water. Mm. And if you were to have a conversation with the monkey and say, yo, why don't you go after your bananas, aka your dreams, He'd probably say, well, that's the way things have always been done around here. Mm. And, or I've gone one step further and say, it would probably say, I didn't even see them. Because how our brains play, if we're denied a certain thing for so long, our reticular activating system won't even see the opportunity in our awareness. You've probably seen so many people come up to you or even like in, inside of your life and somewhere along the line say something like, yeah, but I wish I had something like that or it's not easy for. And they think that there's a lack of opportunities in the world. But it's not a lack of opportunities. It's a lack of their awareness of what's actually possible to them. Mm. But our environment plays the biggest part on that because like, let's say if we're surrounding ourselves with a lot of people that are selling the nightmare, as mm. you're saying, school system, even some families we grow up in, friend circles, and they're all saying that's not possible, that's not possible. It's just like you can't have your bananas, you can't have your bananas. Right. And then eventually we go, well, fuck, maybe I can't. Until we actually change our environment radically, until we surround ourselves with people like you, like me, like, like probably all our networks where they're like, what the fuck are you talking about? You can't have that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. What I, I, I want to have some fun. That's good. I want to have some fun. I want to put you on the spot with a few things. You want to have some fun? Let's do it. You want to role play? Let's role play. So I want to hit you with a few sales objections. Okay. And I'm gonna, right. I haven't told you what I'm going to say right here. Yeah. And I just want to see exactly what you would actually say. Okay? So let's say... How how do you, how do you want to do this? Should we pretend to be selling something? Is Play, it important, hit me, is bro. It, this is fun. Is it important? For no, you no, to be no, selling just, something? no, no. Just just hit me with an objection. Okay. Uh, doesn't matter what we're selling. Yeah, right? just just give me a, any product. Okay, let's cool. just have fun. Give me a multiple ones. <clears throat> okay, so okay, let's say let's just say because I got a bottle of water here. Okay. 
you're selling this bottle of water to me. It's sparkling water. Mm-hmm. Okay, and it's missing a label as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's exactly how it is. And you're telling me, and I just say, Daniel, I'm just not very interested in it. Yeah, completely understand, man. Hey, listen, uh, before I even gave you a call and we sat down today to even look at the water, there's a lot of things that we have to go through to even make sure the water is the right fit for you. Let me ask you a question. When you usually choose water to drink, what do you look for inside of water that you usually choose? Like, is it the minerals? Is it usually the price? What are you exactly looking for? I like to get sparkling water. Because sparkling water just makes me feel better when I drink it. Yeah, stop, pause. So we're going to do lessons throughout every single objection. Okay, cool. So <clears throat> let's stop on that one. I'm right back inside of a conversation. Yeah. Right? Uh, I think what people do is, because I know my whole job of injection is number one, just get back inside of the conversation. What people do is they fight an objection. My job is not to fight it. Because now we're going to have a whole conversation going back into it. And now I'm going to have to present and get inside of a close. How would they fight it? Like Perfect. Def- yeah, defend exactly. It. Yeah. So when they, when they get it, you hit me with the objection again, let's do it again. Uh, I'm not interested, man. But, but what are you not interested about? And now I'm getting def- like, you're yeah, getting I'm defensive. Just, and and I'm then, like, yeah. And then you're just going to say, you're going to say the same thing. You're gonna be like, well, man, you know, it's I'm not just not interested in it right now. And then it just goes down this whole negative spiral, right? To, I always say the first thing is just like, you know, just, uh, offset the objection, just break the tension off the objection. You don't necessarily have to agree with the objection. You don't have to agree. You have to acknowledge objections, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. Completely understand. Hit me with another one. I'll show you. We'll go through the same formula every single time. Okay, cool. Okay, so the next one would be, what are we selling this time? Um, a network marketing product. Hair products. Yeah. Okay? Okay. You're selling me hair products. Okay. So I can grow a luscious beard. This oh, Italian nice, nice, beard nice, like nice. you, okay? Yeah. And I'm going to say to you, look, Daniel, I just don't have the money. Yeah, completely understand. Hey, let me ask you a question. In the, you know, in the time frame of you raising the capital. First of all, is this something that you want to do? Is it, did you want to you know, get new hair products so you don't have to go to Turkey again and spend five thousand dollars on a <laughs> you know on a transplant or some some new hair? You yeah. rather you rather pay the price today than pay the price in the future? Yep. Something you want to do or you want to keep taking the flights out to Turkey? Whoa. Turkey is good. Yeah, Turkey's nice. The food's nice. Turkey yeah, Turkey is good. But Morgan, but, it's but, something you want you want to grab the products? Forget the money. Do you want to grab the products? Yeah, I, I want a beard like you. Okay, cool. You want a nice that, that Italian, I want that Sicilian Italian beer. Love it. thing. Perfect, man. Hey, listen, I'm going to, in the meantime of you raising the capital to buy the products, because the products only cost 500 bucks. And I know this, if I was sitting down with you right now, uh, whether you know you had the money or you didn't have the money, if you didn't think the products were right for you, you still wouldn't buy it. So I even know when you do get the $500 in a week to two weeks, whenever you get paid from your business and working like we were talking about in the beginning of the conversation, if these aren't the right products for you, you're still not going to buy it. You're going to go out to the club and spend it on Grey Goose or go spend it on a movie or go spend it on clothes. If this is not the right product that's going to fit you, you're still not going to buy it. So in the conversation today that we had about the products that are going to grow your hair, what were you still a little bit confused and skeptical about if these products were to work out for you? So I could just put it inside of an email. That way, in the next week of you raising the capital, you can look at what's inside of the product and make sure this is the right product change for you and it's going to be the right lifestyle change over the next week. And then you can see yourself even selling these products and recommending it to other people because that's also important. Was it a little bit more about, you know, you actually using the product and liking the product and you feel like it's worth it and you're actually going to use it every single day because if you're not going to use it, it's not worth it. Was it a little bit more about what's inside of the product? You don't know if what's inside of the product is actually going to work out to you, like, you know, the science behind it, the carotene that grows your hair, or it's a little bit about, you know, you maybe even recommending the products. You don't know how to use social media. You don't know where to find people to recommend the products and you don't have a system to do so. What do you want me to put inside of an email? That way, when I send it over to you, you can look at it and say, okay, I have all the answers. What can I put inside of there? You want me to answer it? Yeah, sure. We're in role play mode. What can you put inside of it? Um, What can I just text you over? That way, when you're ready to join, you're confident to join. Yeah, well, you know, because when I go through, I, I really want to know what's inside of all the chemicals and shit like that. Because yeah. for some weird reason, whenever I go to purchase anything like this, oh, I, have to, moved. I have to know objection all moved. the ingredients. Moved. What did it I say? Moved. What did the I objection do? moved. What did you I just do? gave me an objection about money. 30 seconds ago, you said, Daniel, I don't have the money to buy this product. Yeah. I just moved the whole objection to, I don't have the money to, I don't fucking now know about, about the, the science of right. the product. And most people will never get to the deeper fear because they make money the issue. They pour gasoline on the money thing. Well, when do you get paid and they make it the issue? But I'm like, well, how about if he's scared about the science? Or how about if he's scared about the referral and you're dealing with an objection that's not even the truth? 
Mm. The objection moved from money to you freaking saying, well, I'm not, you know, certain about, you know, the science behind the product. I use other products and it killed my hair. And now we're having a product issue and an objection issue. So I say the number one thing about objection is don't put gasoline on the first thing that they give you. Because mm. there might be a bare naked truth behind that objection where you can get a little bit deeper, right? So I just showed you in like real time and you didn't even know. You're like, yeah. you're like, well, wh what do you mean? I'm talking about... I said, yeah, the, the objection just moved. You you totally forgot about the objection you just gave me 30 yeah, seconds ago. Yeah. We're on a whole nother conversation. Just the ability to let your customer feel like they can exit the conversation. It's the most important thing. What's up, Dream Nation? Have you ever wondered how far ahead your life would have already been if you had got access to this type of content at a younger age? Look, this is why I need your help. I'm trying to build the number one personal development platform out there to teach you guys the tips, tricks, and attitude of what it takes to live your dream life and to bring the type of education that we all wish we had in school. This show only grows by word of mouth and new subscribers. So it would mean the world to me if you could smash that subscribe button right now, leave us a five-star written review or drop a comment below and share this episode with a friend. I would be forever grateful. All right, now let's get back into this episode. Is, is there ever a time where, like let's say money, is there ever a time where it's actually real? Like, cause I know there's fear-based objections and there's some logistical. How do you sort of, and then I've got a couple more, we can go a couple more, but how do you sort of decipher the fact of like, could I actually keep going? Is this person closable? Mm. What's your opinion on this? Yeah, is, this is a good question. Yeah. I, I, 150% there's times where the money's real. It's not whether or not the money thing is real. What you're trying to do is whether it is real or if it's not real, regardless, they're always going to have money. They'll have money. So let's say the objection is real. Daniel, mm -hmm. I don't have money, right? And they get paid four weeks down the road. And now they really don't have money, right? So what's your job? Your job is to make sure that in four weeks down the road, they're sold on you and they're not sold on somebody else. Mm. So what's my job? Okay, make sure I know all their fears, their wants and needs. I keep following up with them the right way. I know everything as to why and why they don't want the product, et cetera. So yeah, of course, I think money would be a factor. You know, if 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 it's 150% they can't invest, my job is to always do this. As a sales rep, because, you know, we've always heard this, you know, fortunes in the follow-up, right? And I agree. I agree the fortunes in the follow-up. But I also say this. I say, why is never, you know, why has nobody ever told me fortunes in the close? Like mm. fortunes in the amount of attempts that you do on one phone call. I've never heard that before. I've always heard fortunes in the follow-up. And when you hear that message as a sales rep, when you first start to start off in sales, what you do is like, oh, okay, fortunes in the follow-up. Well, let me just fucking quit on the objection thing right now. Let me go into follow-up. So when you get paid, Morgan, well, you've already quit. No, fortunes in the amount of attempts that you do on one phone call. So like, yes, you have to follow up four to five times if you didn't attempt to close a freaking customer four to five times on one phone call. So then you got to follow up four to five times because maybe you don't know what they want more of or what they want less of. So I always say fortunes in the amount of times that you attempt on the first phone call. I think every single true player inside of sales attempts to close somebody four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You know this 10 different times on one phone call until it's done, mm. it's done, it's done. They tried an amount of times where now they have to go into follow up. Fortune is only in the follow up when fortune is not in the close on the first call. So I always say to program yourself right inside of sales. Make sure you tell yourself fortunes in the amount of attempts that I do on the first call. You do that, you're programming yourself to work and not freaking quit on the first call. That's sales, right? Yeah. Because I always heard fortunes in the follow-up, so I always move to follow-up. Well, yeah. Let me hold a fat pipeline to the end of the month. Mm. Yeah, all right. We got another one here. So let's say we're, we are selling, you're selling me a car this time, okay? I'm going to say, you, cause let's say it's a bigger purchase. You're selling yeah. me a $40,000, $50,000 car. And I say to you, hmm, let me think about this one. Yeah, 150%. So I'm going to go the exact same route that I went before. Hey, 150%. Mark, think about it. I know this is a big purchasing decision for you and your family. Let me ask you a question, Mark, whoever I'm role-playing with. Let me ask you a question, Bob. Yes. Hey, by the way, Morgan, when you do think about something like this, right, how long do you need to think about it? Do you need, you want a couple hours? You want a couple of days, I mean, couple like a couple months, just couple give me, days. A couple of days is good. Yeah. Perfect. Why don't we take at least a week? What the sure. Fuck? Sure. Why not? Why not? Have fun. Is it the thinking about it? Do you think I always wait, we're pausing right now in role play. With two days and a week change, no. In two days is his thought process gonna change? No, if he doesn't have the right information, it's not gonna change. Mm -hmm. So you say let me think about it. I say how many days do you need to think about it? A couple of days. A couple of days. Let's take four. Good. Let's take four days. Let's take four days to a week. Because regardless, Morgan, whenever you you know you're ready to do something like this, you're gonna have to make a decision whether or not this is the right car for you to drive, right? So I'm gonna do my job in the next four days to seven days, 
well, you're thinking about it. I'm going to do my job. I'm going to make sure I put everything inside of a message that you can look over. So when you are ready to do something like this, you have the comparables, right? Because obviously if you're ready to do something like this and you are certain on every single fact of the car, you would say yes today. So I'm going to send you over some information right now inside of an email. That way you have all the comparables, right? And you can do your research over the next two to four days, however long you need to think about it. What do you want me to put inside of the email right now? Do you want me to put a little that you're uncertain about today and still about the car? Because you're still uncertain. If you were certain you were by today, right? Perfect. What do you want me to put inside of an email right now that can make you a little bit more certain over the next four days to think about it? Was it a little bit more about, you know, the, the price of the car? and the cost savings in the long run. So the price today versus the cost that you're gonna pay inside of the future. So it was a little bit more about money of the vehicle, it was a little bit more about you know the aesthetics of the vehicle and you don't know if this is the right vehicle for you and you wanna go shop some other vehicles or you like some different shapes of the vehicle. Or I know in the beginning of the conversation you were talking about fuel efficiency of the vehicle because you wanted to drive it for long runs and you don't know if this vehicle is gonna be right on fuel. What were you still a little bit uncertain about? That way I could put inside of an email. So when you think of over, over the next two to four days, you're certain when you wanna make a decision. What were you still a little bit uncertain about? that I could put inside of there. Love it. Cause I, I like this because I kind of am that person. Right. Right. Like, and, and like, I'm not in sales, but everything sales. I'm in business, so I'm in sales. So, and, and I can even sometimes catch myself. This is why I like, I'm actually like, I don't do the sales in my business cause I'm just too fucking chill sometimes. Yeah. So sometimes I'll talk to people and they're like, yeah, hey, let me think about it. Yeah, get it. Cool. Cause I'm like, I, I usually think about it. Mm -hmm. I, I usually just have like a convincer, like a one or two day type thing. Give me everything. Let me simmer on it. I'm going to suss it. And also, I wouldn't be having a conversation if I wasn't at least like 80, 90% kind of keen on this. Yeah. So I've just got to, you know, there's a few things usually for me, but then it's a day and I make a decision on it. Um, but I, I kind of like it because like, I know some people in like, I guess like old school sales, it's like, keep, keep, keep trying to close, keep trying to close, keep trying to close, keep trying to like get, get them on it, right? When, yep. when they're logistically like, no, this is just how I make decisions. Like I, leg I legitimately make, make decisions. You're saying some people make decisions a lot longer than uh, other people. Well, knowing what I, see so here's, like I know a shit ton about just the way our brain's made up, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, how I'll do sales, maybe I'll tell you in the car right after here, I ask a couple certain questions to people and I can sort of figure out, you know, like people's Myers-Briggs, you've mm -hmm. done that? So I ask a couple questions and sort of figure out how they kind of process information in their brain and how they actually make decisions. And then I'll speak that language back to them. Right. So some people have a convincer. So some people have, and this is what I'll, I'll, I'll say this question. So when I hire a manager, I'm going to ask them a question so simple as, um, how, do you, how do you know when someone has done a good job? Do you know it automatically? Or do you need to see them do it a few times? Or are you never convinced? And then they're going to tell me. Like I'm someone who's like, I just know right away. Which is so I don't make a good manager. A good manager might say, I need to see them do that. I need to see them do it four or five times. They have a four or five time convincer. Mm -hmm. So they need to see, like, so if I can ask a question like that, I'm going to know that what they're really getting to see is the proposition probably put to them three or four or five times. So it makes sense in their head a few times. Right. They may have to look at it a few more times. Instead of trying to close them straight away, I'm going to give them that space because so, they probably will give it to me, leave it with me. I'm going to run it over tonight again. And probably another time tomorrow morning. Mm. Great. I'm going to speak to you in three days then. And then it's like, it makes a lot of sense. You spoke to me at the right perfect time. Right, right, Damn right. Damn right I did. All right. Another one. What are we selling this time? Anything, bro. A house. Okay. Close me on a house. Good, good, good. I got to speak to my partner. Yeah. It's a house, man. Yeah. You kind of expect me to close so, today. So um, every objection that you get, I think, is a reflection of what you can do better. Because they're going to come up regardless. It's not like you're not going to... The weight is the weight, I always say inside of sales. The weight is the weight. We'll, we'll talk about the objection. It's like... The weight doesn't fucking move. Like 20 pounds is always going to be fucking 20 pounds. Can't complain about, the, oh, 50 pounds on the bench press or 450 pounds on the bench press or 150 pounds on the bench press. If that's the weight that's on the freaking bench press, it's not fucking moving. It's there. It's 150 pounds. So you can bitch and complain that the weight's heavy, right? You can say, oh, man, the weight's heavy, man. I'm just not fucking strong enough. Or you could just get fucking stronger. Life. Now, same thing inside of sales. You can bitch and complain about prospects always giving you objections. Hey, I need to think about it. I need to speak to my spouse. I don't have the time to do something like this. I don't have the money. Let me speak to my mom and dad. Send me over some information. Uh, you know, uh, I don't make decisions this fast. I'm not ready to do it right now. Uh, can you send me over an email? You can bitch and complain all you want. But at the end of the day, you don't get better. You can't complain and make commissions at the same time. The objection is always going to freaking be there. And typically, nine times out of ten, it's a reflection of what you could do better inside of a sales rep. You can only complain or get better, but you can't do both at the same time. You can complain or make a fucking sale. 
can't do both at the same time. Why am I saying this? Because when you just told me the objection, well, I need to speak to my spouse. Okay, great. What does it show me as a sales trainer or a sales coach? Hey, by the way, maybe this person maybe lacked authority, so they have to go to another authority figure, number one. Or maybe this person lacked qualifying in the beginning stage and they should have never sat down a one leg sit. They should only sit down a two leg sit, which is a husband, and a, a wife or a wife and a husband. And then they went through the whole presentation. They shot themselves in the foot. So it's mm. reflection of what you, what you should have done. Because I say every single objection, there's like a translation towards it. Somebody says, I don't have the money. Good. Your fault. You can't complain and get better. How's that my fault? Well, you show them that they're spending money and not investing money, so they hit you with the objection, I don't have the money. I don't have time to do something like this. Perfect, your fault. You show them that this is not gonna save their time or you didn't have a sense of urgency inside of sales, so they hit you with the time objection. I need to speak to my mom, my husband, my wife, my my aunt, my uncle, my spouse, my, my mom, my dad, whatever the case is, perfect. You fucking lacked authority inside of the sale, so now they were a little bit uncertain, so they had to go to another authority figure. I always say sales is a reflection of you. It's an inside game first before it's an outside game. Mm. You get better at dealing with the inside things first. Like ma imagine if you lack urgency as an individual, then everybody's going to take their time with you. Like if you lack, if you look at somebody, like if you come into something and you're slow, then people are going to abuse your time. Of course, when you're on a phone call, hey, how's your day going today? Hey, by the way, we got about 45 minutes. I want to make sure we have an effective, you know, communication with each other. Perfect. Now this person respects their time. So I'm not going to hit them with a time objection. I'm going to want to make fast decisions. I say you can't make slow decisions and ask a prospect to make fast decisions. It's always a reflection inside of sales. So usually it's an internal game, right? The spouse thing. Couple things here that I see. Number one, it's like, okay, why'd you sit down and present somebody at home and do a whole walkthrough or do showings? And then you know clearly that they make a decision with somebody else and they have to make that decision with somebody else. And you don't want to ever turn a customer into a champion salesperson. That's not their job. Like I feel like sometimes we have these hopes inside of sales when we sell a product offer or service, whether it's a home, a car, shampoo, health shakes. It's like we have this hope that we're going to sell Jake, the husband, so well that he's going to go home and sell his wife or sell her husband better than we could sell them. That's called turning the prospect into the champion salesperson. I don't want to do that. That's not my job. I know for a fact that the prospect is not going to outsell me. They're not going to do a better job of selling than I can do. So my job is to always get the person on the call because I don't want to turn my prospect into a salesperson, right? So you're saying, so so it's going to be prep from the beginning, right? Like Prep from the beginning. It's like the sales 101, speak to the decision maker. Correct. Right? Yeah. So is, the, is there a way, like let's, let's say you get to the end of a sales presentation, sales call, maybe let's not, not say a house then, okay? Because it's like, probably should fuck speak to your partner about it. Let's say you're selling products. Yeah. Right. Or you're selling a coaching program and they get to the end. Ah, oh, let me see what my partner has to say. <clears throat> um, how do you sort of go about that? Perfect. Hey, listen, uh, Morgan, is your wife working the business with you or are you just doing it yourself right now? I just kind of want to better understand that way. I know how, you know, to follow this journey of how we're going to onboard you. Uh, no, it's just me. Hey, 150%. So now the first thing I have right now, Morgan's working the business. More, you just told me that it's a cheap enough product where it's not a freaking house where they're not going to have a divorce over, right? Mm -hmm. So you said it's products right now. So now I know Morgan's working the business, okay? He doesn't have to go make a decision with the wife. It's probably He's probably just a little bit scared. So my job is just to handle like every other objection. I'm going to say, okay, well, Morgan's working the business. I know when Morgan or I know when Melissa, let's say Melissa says, I have to speak to my husband about something like this. If I know Melissa is going to do the business alone, just like you said, hey, Melissa, are you doing the business yourself? Yes. Okay, perfect. Melissa's doing the business alone. Melissa buys products, by the way, alone 24-7. She doesn't call her husband. Maybe she buys them first and asks for forgiveness second, but when she needs to go buy a bag at the grocery store or she needs to go buy fruits or she needs to go buy a new pair of shoes, she's not calling the spouse and saying, hey, by the way, honey, uh, I have to buy shoes today. Do you think I should buy them for your work convention? And she's buying them first. Mm -hmm. We know that. People are trained consumers. They're trained to buy things. They want to make decisions alone. So I say, hey, perfect. The first thing I'm going to do is say, hey, Morgan, by the way, it's good that you want to speak to your house, uh, your, you know, your spouse, your wife about this. I'm going to mix up in role play names, looking at you as a girl and a guy right now. But uh, I would say, hey, go ponder on it with your husband, right, for the next week or so. Uh, in the meantime of you pondering it, because I know you're going to be working the business by yourself. You said you're going to be doing this by yourself and you're going to use the products by yourself. What were you still a little bit uncertain about? 
That way I can send you over an email, right? Because I know if you're certain about this, you would say yes right away, just like you say yes to other products 24-7. What were you still a little bit uncertain about? That way I can send you over a text message was a little bit more about the products and what's inside the products, a little bit more about how you recommend the products because you don't know a lot of people. If you could do something like this, maybe you don't know have a good sales system or is a little bit more about the time it's going to take to actually use a product, sell the products or start a business like this. What were you still a little bit skeptical about? Customer is going to turn, answer one of the three. Oh, you know, yeah, I just don't know if I have time to do something like this. The objection is going to freaking move. And what I'm doing here, if people just seen the whole theme throughout this like 30 minutes of role play, what I just did every single time was make the customer feel like they can exit the conversation. Because when a customer feels like they can exit the conversation, I can bring them back in. I don't make a cluster, uh, customer feel claustrophobic. Like they have to make something, buy something, do something, sell something on the call. When I don't do that, I make them feel open to answering my questions. Because I always say sales is hard when you program somebody that they have to do something towards the end of a call. When you pro tell somebody, when, when, when a human thinks they have to make a decision, they're closed. So mm -hmm. sales and closing becomes hard. So the opening of a phone call can fuck up the whole closing because closing's not hard. It's how you open a call. Closing would be difficult, right? If the person doesn't tell you what they want more of and less of inside of their life. If you don't know what the person wants more of and what they want less of, closing's hard. The only reason why you don't know what they want more of and what they want less of maybe because you haven't asked them right questions. Maybe you ask them right questions, but they haven't told you the truth. The reason why they haven't told you the truth is because they feel like they have to buy something. When the moment somebody feels like they have to buy something, they're closed off and they're defensive right away. And the reason why they did that in the beginning of the call is because you opened up a call and you made the customer feel like they had to make a decision towards the end of the call. So I can drop my customer's defense within the first five seconds of the call and say, hey, by the way, Morgan, glad to sit down with you today. The only reason why I want to sit down with you today is, you know, better understand who you are and what you want more of outside of life, what you want less of and what you want more of, right? That way I can give you all the information, right? And you could take back all the information towards the end of the call. And whenever you're ready to make a transition the next six months to a year, at least you have all the information for the back of your pocket inside of the future. You you know, inside of the back of your pocket for the future, whenever you're ready to transition to a new job. I just told Morgan exactly what he wants to hear. Come on the call, steal everything, buy nothing, you can leave the call. That way, Morgan's open and vulnerable throughout the whole call. Oh, fuck, I could tell this guy everything about me. And how, how do people fuck it up? Because what, what in the beginning instead? stage, they say this. Hey, by the way, uh, you know, I just want to learn a little bit more about you. That way, if I feel like we can help you, I can show you exactly what we have to offer. And then you could just give me a simple yes or no towards the end of the call. Fucked it up. People don't even know they're doing this. Why? They just heard it from a million sales trainers. Well, you know this. You heard mm. the script a million times. I hear it a million times. Hey, just let me know if you're yes or no towards the end of call. Why? You're basically telling the prospect, hey, I'm going against the way you buy. Because a prospect says this. You know a prospect. Everybody likes to buy. Nobody likes to be sold. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay, perfect. So let the customer feel like they're in control. Don't make the customer feel closed off. You're going against the way they buy. The customer says this, I want to get everything, buy nothing. That's the customer's job. I'm coming in the car dealership today. I want to I want to get something. Hey, sir, are you looking around for nothing? No, thank you. I'm just shopping. I don't want to fucking talk to you. I don't want to be sold by you. Do you think it could be case dependent though? Because let's say if I'm if I'm going to sell a car, yep. I would never go into a conversation with that person and say, hey, let, yep, let's go have a test drive, blah, blah, blah. And the only thing I want is yes or no. I would, yeah. not, I would no way do that. Correct. But if I get people on a call, like let's say today, if somebody gets on a call right now and I'm going to give them half an hour of my time. Yeah. And they want to buy ten thousand dollar program something. Yeah, I I do actually sort of say that I'll say at the start like, uh -huh. hey, look, the intention of this call is I want to figure out exactly where you're at, blah blah blah. What do you if, want? If we can help, all the rest of and it. And then just um, give me a simple yes or no. Yeah, and at the end, just tell us yes no. That way, we're not fucking around. Yeah, like really. And and I've found that kind of works. So do you think it's like a case dependent on, or is it like a high ticket versus, like, what do you kind of think on that? Question is this, like, I'm I'm going to change everybody's perspective right now. Why? Should the customer be telling you no? Well, people are like, well, what does that mean? I said, as a great sales rep, your job is to do what? Qualify and tell the customer fucking no. That's what a great sales rep does. So why do I even have to ask, hey, your job is to make a decision? No, 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 no. My job in the beginning stage is to figure it out if you're right or not. If I figure out that you're right or not, the, the only thing I'm trying to do is just make my prospect open and vulnerable enough to give me the truth. If I have the truth, I can sell them. If I know their pain points, if I know what they want less of and what they want more of, I don't care if they fucking said, no, I'm not buying from you the moment they come inside of the sale. I don't care about that. You should come into the sale and actually tell me no. But if I'm a great salesperson and I have the ability to make you feel calm, cool, and coll uh, collective, more than any other salesperson, you're gonna tell me everything about your life. When I know all the facts and figures and how your life's in a fucking shithole or what you want more of and your dream freaking vision because you're so open with me, 
I don't even give a fuck if you said yes, oh, I'm going to give you a yes or no decision. I know all the ammunition, product and closing becomes easy because I understand people. It's the problem is people don't understand other people. So now product and closing becomes difficult. But I know this, the moment I can get a client to open up to me, right? What they want more of and what they want less of. I'm 99% of somebody that just wants a client to say, yes, I'm going to give you a decision. I'm 99% ahead of them. If I can get somebody, and you know this, intuition plays a big part inside of sales. It's one of your highest faculties, I think. You know when a client's not be just giving you one-word answers. When they're actually going a little bit deeper with their answers. They're saying, hey, you know, it's a, you know, it's a good question that you asked me. And they're just not like, yeah, no, mm -hmm. yes, no. So my question becomes this, just to play devil's advocate. Even if you ask a prospect, by the way, towards the end of the phone call, I just want to give you, you know, just give me a yes or no decision. And they're like, yes, okay. First of all, that's a one-word answer, right? Yes, you get, you gain commitment, love it. But then how about if they're just saying yes, okay, throughout the whole phone call? How about if they're just in that mindset? Like if you just have the prospect just fucking saying yes throughout the whole call, are they gonna get a yes towards the close? Fuck no, that's 1970. Somebody says, hey, by the way, just programmed it to say yes and towards the end of the call, they're just gonna say yes to you. Well, probably not. You don't know how to hit them on what they want inside of their life. How do you even know how to make a recommendation or, hey, by the way, you just told me that you're the mother of three and that you've been struggling with XYZ. Forget about what we're about to talk to today, about you and I. I'm gonna show you a list inside of our business. She was a mother of three that you know went through the exact same thing as you. Let me show you inside of what happened over the last six months. Yeah, you would never be able to fucking say that if you didn't have the prospect open up and tell you about her struggles. But now the prospect looks at you and says, holy shit, this feels different than a sales conversation. Subconsciously, every prospect likes something that's not scripted. Just like when you watch somebody speak on stage, you like somebody that speaks on stage that's not scripted. That's what the human mind loves. When you watch somebody speak on stage, you're like, holy fuck, it looks like they're not reading off of a script. I love this person. Same thing inside of sales. When a salesperson can say, hey, by the way, I was about to you know, show you XYZ, but because you told me you're in XYZ position, let me tell you about Alyssa inside of our business. Uh, she was a mother of three like yourself that went through the same position that you went through. I'm gonna show you her journey over the last six months. Sexy, the person's listening. That's a fucking sale. Prospect says in their head, oh fuck, somebody's listening to me. That's sexy, the person buys right there. That's, I, it, it's weird. When you get great at sales, you know when people buy before they even say yes. Mm. They say, shut up, just sign me up. And, and I know right there the person bought. Why? I say nobody gives a fuck about your product, your business, or your story until you care about their product, their business, and their story. And you may realize 15 minutes inside of the conversation that your fucking story is useless to Melissa and somebody else's story is 10 times more effective. But you wouldn't know that if you didn't understand Melissa. It's a people's business, right? So these are the most effective conversations, I think. It's like everybody loves somebody that goes deep and not wide. Mm. Goes a little bit deeper. Why do you love sales so much? Because it changed my life, man. I don't think there's there's no, I think sales has changed so many people's lives unexpectedly. Yeah. It's like unexpected. It's, and, and to me, the sexiest thing inside of life, it's like spontaneity. It's like, this shit came out of fucking nowhere. What, sales? It's like, you don't dream to be a salesperson. So when somebody's like, well, why do you love sales so much? I say, well, I'll give it to you right now. People don't know this. I was born and raised in Toronto, Canada. English was my first language. It was my first language. When I was in when I was in when I was in elementary school, they put me in ESL, English as a second language. But I was born and raised in Toronto, Canada. But I was in ESL, English as a second language. Okay? And I used to go to after school training called Kumon after school too as well. So I was in ESL with my friends that weren't born and raised inside of Canada. And I went to fucking Kumon, which was an after school uh, training and program learning for kids that were slow inside of school that got shitty grades inside of school. They'd, so everybody looked at me and they're like, oh, this kid's a fucking write off. <laughs> like this kid was born and raised in Canada. He's in ESL classes. Plus he's in extra tutoring towards the end of school because he can't even get, you know, B's and C's inside of the classroom. He can't even get D's. He's getting straight F's. This kid's a fucking write-off. Sales saved my life. Nobody would ever think, hey, by the way, oh, this kid's gonna go on to make millions of dollars. I say sales is the only thing inside of the world that doesn't give a fuck about who you were yesterday. It doesn't judge you. It didn't say, Daniel, by the way, we can't accept you because you were in ESL and you were in Kumon. It says, come in if you can work hard, you can get paid a shit ton of money. It doesn't judge you for who you were yesterday. It's the only job in the world where um, you can shut your mouth and make money towards the end of the month, I say. And majority of jobs, you can't do that. Like if you're stuck in a job 
and you got like think of it it's, it's one of the only careers in the world where you, what you get in is what you get out it's garbage in garbage out so if it's the end of the month and it's december right now it's december 29th and you're having the shittiest fucking month or you got more month than you got money towards the end of the month you got more expenses than you got money saved up towards the end of the month and you got a cell phone bill that's $450 or you got a car bill that's $450 sales is the only fucking profession in the world where you could shut your mouth, go close a client and make them pay for the bill. That's it. I say you can't complain or make commissions at the same time. That's the beauty of it. It's like if we want to go out right now, you and I are salespeople. If we want to go out right now and we want to go grab freaking dinner and the tab is $1,300 for dinner, $1,300 and somebody pays for fucking dinner in my head. No, Daniel, don't pay for dinner. No, I'll pay for dinner. I'm not paying for it. What am I paying for? Hey, I just closed 17 clients this week. Those 17 clients are paying for the dinner. Only can do that inside of sales. To me, I say it's the only job in the world where you could put in and you get back what you deserve and what you've earned inside of life, right? It's the only job where you can, you can buy something for somebody and say, hey, by the way, what do you want? Daniel, I, my mother, Daniel, I want this bag for Christmas. Good, give me a fucking week and a half. How? I'm gonna find three prospects, close those three prospects, they'll buy you the freaking bag. Sales. To me, best profession inside the world. I defend it the most. Uh, I think, I think, it's dying because people, you know, they want to, you know, fluff things up and, you know, oh, I want to be an online entrepreneur, blah, blah, blah. So I say, well, no, with all this, you're always going to have to be selling somebody something. And I think it's fucking dying. So I'm always trying to come out to Australia, revive it, make it fun, have fun with it, use different analogies, making, making people understand that even if they want to be an entrepreneur like yourself, they're going to have to sell the vision, sell employees to work for them and continuously sell it. And it's not just one step. You don't just sell once you're continuously going to have to sell it every single day. So that's why sales, man. Dude, I love it, man. This has been good. I wish we'll, we'll have to do a round three. Yeah, this was fun. Next dude. time you come back to this Australia, we'll bring you back later this year, perhaps. Hey? But now we got an event. Yes. So, um, mate, so good seeing you again. Thank um, you. Where can everybody find you on at social Daniel media? G. At Daniel G. That's it. Everywhere. Yeah. All right. I don't know if you remember the last question I always ask all my guests. So, we'll hit you again. Yeah. To see if it's changed. If you were to go back to your 18-year-old self and give him 30 seconds of advice, what would it be? I would say, hey believe in yourself before other people believe in you believe in yourself before other people believe in you nobody is going to believe in you until you fucking believe inside of yourself nobody's going to buy into you until you buy into yourself nobody's going to invest into you until you invest in yourself and nobody's going to up your worth until you up your worth yourself and if you don't have the people that you want to be around be the fucking person that you always wanted to be around because sometimes it's hard to find those 10 people that are millionaires because they don't even want you to be inside of the circle so you look at the millionaire and you say okay how do i become that person that people want to be around i wish somebody told me that because i was always like well let me be the let me find five millionaires and i'll be the six well fuck how about if nobody wants you to be in their circle so just become the person Okay, that you always want to attract inside of your life, right? And I think life is just so much easier when you do that.